A new year is here for the Atlanta Hawks, and 2023 might be, let's just say might be, more favorable to Atlanta. We'll get into all of what's going to be happening on the Hawks' upcoming road trip to California, as well as some mailbag questions from you, the listener, coming up. You are Locked On Hawks, your daily Atlanta Hawks podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team, every day. Hello, friends. Welcome to episode 1380 of the Lockdown Hawks podcast. I am your host, Brad Roland, coming to you on a Sunday evening into Monday. And Happy New Year to everyone. It is now 2023. And uh, here we are kicking things off with a new Atlanta Hawks podcast. Today's show is brought to you by Prize Fix as well. First time you should take advantage of that first deposit match up to 100%, up to $100 as well with promo code Locked On. That is prizefix.com, promo code Locked On. And we also encourage you to make this podcast, the Locked On Hawks podcast, your first listen each and every day. Check out the Hawks podcast that you're looking for, which is this one, of course, across podcast platforms, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Odyssey app, Google Play, and then we're also on YouTube on the video side. Uh, today's show will be sort of a grab bag of sorts. We're going to have some mailbag questions that I'm going to answer in the second half of the show, but we're going to start things off with a look at what becomes a four-game West Coast road trip for the Hawks that begins on Monday. I'm recording this again on Sunday, January 1st, and about... I don't know, 25 hours from now, the Hawks will be taking the floor in San Francisco against the Warriors. Uh, broadly speaking, it's a four-game road trip for Atlanta. No back-to-backs. That's a positive. And the travel actually is not too bad outside of having to just go across the country. Uh, teams will tell you, team personnel will tell you, players, coaches, etc. nobody likes these West Coast road trips. They can be good for bonding purposes for a locker room. If guys are uh, you know not getting along or whatever, they're now spending a lot of time together on a long flight, etc. But as far as the basketball is concerned, just kind of breaking even on these West Coast road trips is generally a positive thing. Um, they did build in, though, two, get, two days between games, between the Hawks losing, of course, on Friday and then having to fly out today on Sunday. So honestly, it's about the best setup that you can ask for for a West Coast trip from a travel standpoint. Again, no back-to-backs, plenty of time in between, and the schedule is not too overly tedious. We'll come back to the Warriors game in a second, which is the first game on Monday uh, in San Francisco. But after that, they stick in Northern California to play the Kings on Wednesday. So very brief travel across the Bay. And then um, they go to, uh, to Los Angeles for a rematch with the Lakers on Friday at the game that just happened a week ago, basically, when that happens. And they face the Clippers on Sunday at, at the Artist Fulman Owned Staples Center in Los Angeles. So no travel there either, as those, those teams play in the exact same venue. So no, obviously some late nights for the diehards. Uh, I will be pouring lots of coffee as I try to cover these games from Atlanta. I'll be probably podcasting between, I don't know, 1.30 and 2 a.m., something like that. It's going to be very, very late nights this week. Uh, the first three games are at 10 p.m. Eastern time or later. And the Clippers game is still a 9 p.m. start, despite it being a Sunday. All of that, of course, um, Eastern time. And again, not exactly a gauntlet when it comes to opponents, although it's not easy at all either. This is just one projection, but 538 is a decent barometer here. And they had the first three games of this road trip as basically coin flips. Neither team uh, favored to win by more than like 57% of the time uh, between the Hawks and then their first three opponents on this trip. The, the worst spot on paper is probably that game on Sunday because it's the last game of the road trip and also the Clippers at their current state are the best team the Hawks will play on this road trip because the Warriors don't have Steph Curry's. We'll come back to it in a second. That obviously makes them a lot worse than they normally would be. And uh, the Clippers are pretty pretty close, at least, at least right now, a week ahead, are still pretty close to being full strength. So if you view these four games as like being coin flip adjacent, basically, the most likely outcome of that would be a two and two record. And I think the Hawks would have to be thrilled, honestly, with two and two. Now, fans won't love that for sure. But again, four road games, the Hawks may not be favored in any of them, honestly. They might be favored in one of them, depending on injury stuff and all that. But by tip off, Hawks might be underdogs in all four. If they can go two and two, it'd be actually be a pretty positive outcome overall. But we'll see how that all goes as the Hawks enter this road trip under 500 for the season. As for the Warriors game in particular, we'll kind of do a little preview now because the game is on Monday evening, and that's obviously – we have a way to record this podcast until after the injury reports came out, et cetera. The Warriors have been off since Friday as well, and they were actually at home. So that's an advantage for them. No travel. They've been hanging out in the Bay since Friday. That's an advantage for the Warriors. Injury-wise, though, the Hawks are actually the healthier team, which is a little bit weird to say right now, but that's actually true um, for the Hawks. DeAndre Hunter is listed as questionable again. Now, that's not a guarantee he's going to play. He's been questionable the last two games and did not play, but obviously uh, better to be questionable than out. Uh, Clint Capella is out already for the Hawks. Now, this is the fourth straight game for Capella to be on the uh, injury report as out before the game even starts. I don't have any new answers for you. As soon as I, as soon as I tweeted about the injury report, I got a lot of questions about Capella. It's not great. I'll say that. 
I tried to ask Nate in a pregame availability this week about Capella, and he gave me a very generic non-answer, no specifics at all. The Hawks have given no information, no updates beyond just listing him as out on the injury report. Of course, he did come back. He played one game, and he left in the fourth quarter. They, they called it cramping, and now he's been out for four games with the same calf that cost him time before that. So I'm not going to try to be alarmist here, but it's not great. Uh, he is on the road trip, from what I understand. That's a positive sign. So he's not just like been ruled out for the entire trip, but still out as of Monday, and uh, the Hawks are quite simply not the same team without Clint Capella in the lineup. It'd be very, it'd be not, very nice to have Hunter, to be sure. Uh, even if you are not the biggest Hunter fan, he is definitely a, a guy that helps the Hawks win defensively in particular, so we'll see if he's able to play on Monday. Um, as for the Warriors, I mentioned before, Steph Curry has missed, uh, this will be his ninth game in a row that he's been out. Andrew Wiggins also out. So basically, you know, two of their top four or five guys, including by far their best player in Steph Curry. And uh, short answer, the Warriors are not the same team without Steph Curry. So we'll come back to that in a second. Also, the Warriors will be without James Wiseman, Jonathan Kaminga, Andre Iguodala, and Jermichael Green. But the big the big absences are obviously um, Curry and Wiggins. And I think also, you know, Kaminga's been pretty good for them this year at times. As for the Warriors' profile overall, they have managed to go 5-3 and three without Steph to this point. But that's kind of fluky if you look at the numbers. They're actually uh, – they have like a minus 5 net rating in that, in that sample. And for the season, they are have, they have a plus 7 net rating with Curry on the floor, which is excellent, of course, and a minus 8 net rating with Curry off the floor, which is terrible. And that paints the picture of how important he is to everything they do. And honestly, Wiggins, while he used to be violently overrated, I thought, last year was he was really, really good down the stretch, and he's very, very valuable. So that's a big absence, too, on its own. The Hawks just can't – sorry, the Warriors just can't score without Steph, really. They have a 105 – Offensive rating for the season, that would be like a league worst number over the full season without Steph on the floor. And uh, Golden State also has trouble t- taking care of the ball. Bottom five turnover rate, they're also not really good at getting into the Levant- at the free throw line offensively. So there's some areas for the Hawks to uh, make their bones in this matchup. And uh, favorably, you could say, um, while I'm a huge supporter of Capella and the th- how important he is, this is, a ma- this is a matchup where his absence shouldn't be as glaring as it is in some. The Warriors don't really attack the rim in a way that some other teams do. Now, the Hawks will have, to, uh, will have their hands full with Jordan Poole in particular on the, at the point of attack. The Hawks have had a lot of trouble staying in front of ball handlers in recent days. Clay Thompson, still a threat. Draymond Green makes life hard for everybody involved, obviously, for the opposition. But I think the uh, – basically, long story short – the Hawks might be small underdogs in the betting market. I've seen some numbers floating out there. Nothing official at this point. I think the Hawks are going to probably open the game as a small underdog on the road. But certainly a winnable game, especially without Steph. Um, if Steph was playing, I would be a little bit more pessimistic, obviously, with the Hawks in this spot. But uh, given that Trey is available, and so is DeJounte and John Collins, etc., the Hawks probably have the better roster, in my mind, that's available for this game. And uh, they do have to go across the country, but uh, certainly one that is not exactly a, uh, a cross-off on paper. Um, one question before we get to the, the uh, break and then the rest of my mailbag questions. This is kind of adjacent to the uh, preview of the uh, West Coast trip. And it comes from Bill, who says, it felt like 2022 was really rough for the Hawks. Do you have any numbers on the calendar year? Were the Hawks even 500? I want to know how bad it was. So uh, the calendar year, obviously not not usually how you look at NBA stats. I kind of had to do some separating here, but I do have the numbers for you. Uh, of course, last year, Post January 1 in the regular season, the Hawks were 27 and 20 with a plus 125 point differential. That's the total, not per game, obviously. Uh, this year, they're 17 and 19 and they're minus 35 overall in those 36 games. So that's one That's one thing. So basically, they're 44 and 39 overall in regular season games they were in 2022. So five games over, over 500, basically the equivalent of a 44 ish win team over, the, over, a full se- over, over a full season. 90 plus point differential. That's not terrible, obviously. Then you throw in, they were one and four in the playoffs against the Heat. They got smashed in that series. They were minus 60 in those games. Yikes. Uh, they were 2 and 0 oh in the play in, though, for plus 35. So if you include all of the postseason action, that includes the play in and the playoffs and the regular season games, all the games in 2022, this does not include Summer League, by the way, or preseason, but the games that actually counted in the standings, the Hawks went 47 and 43, and they outscored opponents by plus 65 points. So basically, they were, I don't know, the equivalent of like a 42 or 43 win team over the entirety. If you include the playoffs and all that stuff, obviously the playoff loss was not great. Uh, the Hawks were not very good early in the season last year. But when you when you factor in January 1st on, they were pretty good. And then this year, not so good. But um, if you're looking for a positive, last year, this was a second half team. So perhaps that's still the case for this year's team. And we'll have more on that in a moment. But first, a word from our sponsors on the show today. <laughs> Today's show is brought to you by Price Picks. If you're looking for a DFS option this year, check out the award-winning app at Price Picks. Price Picks Daily Fantasy made easy. I love it, and I know that you will too. It's so easy to use. I can vouch for that. I've been playing there for a 
really a long time at this point at Prize Picks, and I really enjoy going through all the numbers. All you have to do is pick two six players and choose whether they have more or less than a certain number of points or rebounds or assists or steals, etc. And at Prize Picks, we're up to 25 times the money on any entry that you're doing. Prize Picks is also offers any numbers on sports that you might enjoy across the board. That includes the NBA, of course, but also college basketball. NFL, college football, MLB, soccer, esports, and much more. The entire entry can be done just a minute or less. It's that easy and that quick. Plus, it's just it's you, you against the, project, the projected numbers, not just you against other, other people. It's much easier to uh, sort of evaluate how you're doing through that lens. And they also have safe and fast withdrawals. They're operating in more than 30 states plus Canada at this point. And you can download the PrizePix app today or at PrizePix.com to sign up and play daily fantasy sports. And first time users can have a 100% instant deposit match up to $100 if you use the promo code locked on. One more time, and don't forget this to enter the promo code locked on and sign up for an instant deposit match up to $100. Check it all out now at Price Picks. All right, we'll dive into the mailbag now. First question comes from Perry, who says If David Millen resigned or was fired, who would take over for the Hawks? There was no question when Pierce was fired, but it seems less clear now. Uh, to answer the question, I do agree that it's less clear this time around, simply because last time when they fired Lloyd Pierce, everyone knew. Uh, even before the season started, when they hired Nate, that if anything w- went wrong with Lloyd, it was going to be Nate they called because Nate McMillan is an established head coach. Um, and honestly, the only way he wasn't going to be the interim guy, especially at least at least the interim guy, was that was basically if he said no to the offer. Um, this time around, it is less clear. I do think Joe Prunty is the logical name. He is the lead assistant in title for the Hawks. He's the elder statesman of, of the front of the uh, coaching staff. He's been a head coach before in a small sample size, but so I think he would probably be the guy again, unless he said no or something like that. Um, it's not a terribly sexy option. The Hawks could go to Mike Longabardi, who they brought in fresh this year. He's been around the block for sure. Um, you know, Nate's son's on the staff. It's a little bit interesting. Obviously if Nate were to walk away, have his son still be on the staff, that's a little bit challenging in a lot of ways. Uh, but there's nothing fantastic about that. I think that's maybe part of the reason why, as I talked about a lot on Friday's show, by the way, that show is still very listenable. If you want to check that podcast out about the Hawks Lakers game, also all of my thoughts on David Millen and the reported consideration of him, res- uh, him, him resigning as the head coach of the Hawks. That's all in there from Friday night into Saturday. But as I, as I talked about on that show, you know, part of the reason why I, I think the Hawks want Nate to stay and not resign is that they don't have a logical option. This is not a situation where they can just hand the ball off to somebody basically and uh, have the same exact level of gravitas on that bench. Um, I know I get questions all the time about certain names like Kenny Atkinson, a former Hawks assistant, or Quinn Snyder, a former Hawks assistant, or Ima Yudoka, a very popular name in some circles and a very unpopular name in other circles. Um, but none of those guys are going to come midseason. So those are all maybe for next when, next summer, basically. If something were to happen to Nate, we can talk about all those things if you want to, and I'm sure we will if that happens. But for now, um, I would be pretty surprised if the Hawks – were to move on from Nate either by resignation or firing. And I think, again, right now, I think he's safe from firing. If that were to happen in season, it's probably going to be someone like Joe Prunty or Mike Lagabardi. It's not going to be a big splash in the season because that's not usually how that works, especially in the middle of the season. Maybe if it's early on, you have enough time, but guys don't like to take jobs in the middle of the season, basically. So it'd be pretty, pretty shocking if it was outside the organization at that point. All right, question from UGA Lifer, and obviously a great uh, weekend for the UGA Bulldogs. Not so much for Michigan Wolverines, but alas, here we are. Uh, question comes from UJ Lifer, and he says, he or she says, I should say, can Hawks fans take All-Star Weekend off, or will anyone be involved from the organization? Um, I would say it's too early for definitive stuff on All-Star, and I'll probably have more on this in the future, but voting is available now. Uh, you, if you want to vote, you, you can definitely do that for the fan voting aspect. Um, I'm going to leave off the dunk contest and three-point contest for consideration here in this space. Obviously, the Hawks don't really have a logical dunk contest guy. I don't think Colin's going to do it anymore. Three-point contest, Trey has done it before. He's the illogical guy. Maybe Bo, you would want to do it potentially, but alas. In terms of all-star contenders, I think it's probably only going to be Trey that's like firmly in the mix. Now, DeJounte Murray was an all-star last year, but he was an injury replacement. He wasn't quite on that top 24 level. And his numbers this year are not the same as they were last year, which is not surprising. He's not the only guy on his team like he was with the Spurs last year. He's averaging numbers that are like not crazy for All-Star. 20, 20 points, 6 assists, 5 rebounds. Um, but his efficiency is not great. And I think most importantly, uh, the Hawks' record is not very good. For the Haw- If the Hawks had started out, let's say if the Hawks were 22 and 14 right now or 20 or 24 and 12, then you probably have some buzz about maybe Trey and DeJounte getting All-Star buzz. But I think because – the Hawks are where they are in the standings. Getting two All-Stars is pretty tough for the Hawks to actually think about. And I think that I never really thought DeJounte was going to have an All-Star case this year because of the numbers going to go down and also, you know, just kind of the buzz on all of it. But I think that Trey is interesting on him on his own line right now. Uh, remember this, famously, Trey did not make the All-Star team two years ago. 
which that was crazy. That was the wrong decision by all parties involved. And I ranted and raved about that. Even as someone who's not, is not like a huge passionate all-star guy, I thought it was crazy trading to make the all-star team two years ago. Um, but that did happen. So it's not out of the question that it couldn't happen again, even with big counting stats. His numbers this year are worse than they were two years ago. He's averaging 27 and 10. Those are obviously fantastic numbers. He's right near the lead of the league in assists. He's top like 10 in scoring, et cetera. That, that stuff usually guarantees you a spot. And I think if I had to guess right now, he would probably get in. But his efficiency numbers are way down. And the really, the really bad defense, the team record, uh, some good some good sort of sleeper candidates. Tyrese Halliburton's been, been talked about a lot. Um, there are teams that have multiple guys. Donovan Mitchell's in the East now. Uh, Darius Garland might be a sleeper based on his uh, team success so far. Obviously, you have Celtics guys, et cetera. So I don't think Trey's a lock. I think he's probably going to be an all-star. And I think he probably should be one at that point in time. And it, look, it's not like the Hawks are 10 and 26. If the Hawks were in dire straits, he'd be in trouble. But the Hawks are still hanging around the play-in mix right now. And uh, I'm not going to go through all the candidates. There are only a few locks, like actual true locks, you know, Giannis, Embiid, KD, Tatum, et cetera. Trey's in that group, but I think he's going to make it if I had to guess. And we'll come back to that, I'm sure, in the next couple of weeks and months. Um, question from Brent, on also on Trey Young. He says he wanted to ask about uh, about the Hawks being better without Trey conversation that I was having that uh, he said you, you were but talking about me. Um, I think you said, this is his question again, I think you said the Hawks would be below 500 without Trey, and I'm wondering how bad you think it would be if he, was, if he just wasn't on the team or how it might change if the Hawks replaced him with a comparable player. So two very different questions there, obviously. The first one, uh, I didn't do a deep dive on this. I was kind of just talking, people, talking to people on Twitter and trying to answer questions and uh, be just kind of off the cuff about how the Hawks would not be better without Trey. And look, I said this before. I think the notion is very silly that the Hawks would be better, better without Trey. That's just crazy. I'm not even going to go back into it now. But um, the Hawks have done well in one-game samples without Trey, but they've been bad without him for a long time. So to the questions, uh, if you took Trey off the roster entirely and did not replace him with anyone, it would hurt less than in previous years because they had John Tim Murray, but it would still hurt a lot. Um, for one, the lack of depth. I've talked about this for a lot of the season, basically, into, into the summer, et cetera. But the Hawks don't really have a lot of depth on this roster, and it would get even worse if you took the guy who was their leading creator off the floor. Um, DeJounte also can't play 39 minutes a game the entire season, probably. And so there's a lot of minutes to fill there. Trey's also an offensive engine that Murray just isn't quite at that level. So that would obviously hurt the offense no matter what. The Hawks could get better defensively without Trey. That's definitely worth pointing out. But they don't have a lot of guys on this roster right now that are like great options. Yes, Aaron Holiday is better than Trey on defense for sure, but he's not like this stopper. Uh, Trent Forrest is a good defender. He's, a two, he's on a two-way contract. Um, you know, AJ would play more. He's not a great defender. Bogey would play more. Not a great defender. Murray's a good defender in a lot of situations, but not, not perfect by any means. And I think, long story short, if the Hawks took Trey off the team entirely for the full season on this roster, they would probably be like just ahead of the bottom feeding teams in the league. They still have some talent on the roster, but the lack of depth is a concern. And I think the Hawks are better than like the Wizards probably and the bottom and the actual bottom team, like, you know, the Pistons level teams. But would they be in the mix for the play-in? Uh, probably not, I don't think. Um, probably somewhere in like the low 30s would be what would be my guess on the Hawks win total without Trey for the full season. Again, with no one replacing him. That's a, that's a very important part of this conversation. The other part of the question is what would happen if they swap Trey for a play, for a comparable player? Obviously, it's kind of hard to answer that because it matters who the player is. If it's a big man, then it's kind of difficult to kind of weave, weave that guy in. If it's a wing, it's easier. But who is that player? Um, is that player like, you know, J.O. Brown or something? That'd be very helpful. But obviously, he's not better than Trey. So it's a question. Knox will also have to like retool the roster in some ways. If it was a different player, a different position. There's like a very popular fake trade right now of uh, Trey Young for Carl Anthony Towns. That, by the way, I would not do as the Hawks, just for the record. But uh, that's like a bizarre one where, like, you have to change the rest of the roster, too, because you already have two centers and Collins. It's just this bizarre thing. Anyway, um, I've gotten questions about, like, trade packages for Trey. I am not to the point where I'm going to answer those just yet. We're not quite there. I think Trey's, Trey, again, uh, as a for, like, probably the 10th time in the last couple of weeks, Trey isn't getting traded unless he wants to get traded. And I think we'll know that at some point if that happens. But I am not in the fake trade mode with Trey Young whatsoever at this point in time. But... As far as the question is concerned, like hypothetically, could the Hawks have built a better roster around a comfortable play? Like, if you think Trey Young is a top 15 player in the league, which he probably is, yeah. I mean, would it be easier in some ways to, with Murray on the team, to like, if you, tr if you turn Trey into a comparable two-way wing player, yeah, it might be easier to build with that guy. 
but that's not, that's not realistic. It's not going to happen. And obviously they're really more building around Trey than anything else. Uh, and, w- and obviously we've only seen less than a half season of Trey and DeJounte. There's plenty of growth to be had. Trey isn't going anywhere. Trey's very important. Trey is still awesome. Keep that in mind. I know people are kind of lower on him now. Than they've probably ever been since his rookie year, but he is uh, still an awesome player. So nothing really to like functionally melt down about, but as far as like taking him off the roster, it would make the Hawks a lot worse. That's pretty obvious. I think in my mind, but maybe for some, they need to hear that. And uh, it's definitely the case at this point. All right, one more break to hear from our sponsors. We'll come back with more of your mailbag questions and uh, stay tuned. Today's show is brought to you by Built Bar. If you're looking for a delicious treat, but you don't want all the fat and calories that come along with it, you really need to try Built Bar. We, f- we just finished the holidays, of course. I know one of my goals this year is to eat a little bit healthier. And if you're anything like me, that you don't want to give up the taste and actually to uh, get healthier. And if that's the case, Built Bar is a perfect option. With Built Bar, healthy is actually tasty, and they're so delicious that you won't believe that they're actually good for you as well. They have 100% real chocolate. Yes, real chocolate, and they come in a ton of awesome flavors like peanut butter brownie and coconut almond. Built Bars also taste like candy bars, honestly, with 130 calories and 4 grams of sugar to go along with 17 grams of protein. You, don't, you also don't have to wait around now. You can honestly get a box right now today for a long time. I've been telling you to get your Built Bars at Built.com. And honestly, you still can do that. But you can also get them at local Walmart establishments or Sam's Club. That's right. Walk into the pharmacy section of a local Walmart and grab a box of Built Bars. That includes a four box of my personal favorite, Cookies and Cream. Or if you're closer to a Sam's, run and get a 13-bar box right now. Make sure you check out Built Bar regardless today and start your new year flawlessly with Built Bar. All right, question from Ron Ron, who asks, if Edgy Griffin is the player bright spot for the Hawks this year, is there a team bright spot, or has this season been bad enough where there is no bright spot? Um, If you missed it, by the way, I was asked recently on a podcast what the bright spot of the season has been, and I said, basically, from a player standpoint, it's pretty clearly Edgy Griffin. Uh, The only other guy who I I think has been even above average for where he probably was projected to be is Capella, maybe. Um, Other guys have been like at their projections, maybe, but nobody's been better than what what you might have thought other than AJ. And he has been well above any rational projection. You know, maybe if you were a Hawks fan, you were just like sunshine and rainbows and you thought AJ was going to light the world on fire that, you know, that you were right, I guess, to some some degree. But as far as like an actual baseline projection for a 19 year old rookie, he's been better than I think people would have thought, including me Um, on the team side to answer the question. There are some candidates for this. Uh, one is that the Hawks are still awesome in taking care of the ball. That's one thing that they uh, have been good at for quite some time. Uh, l- this year, they have a 12.6% turnover rate. That is tied for number one in the NBA. So anytime you lead the league in a major four-factor category, that's a good sign. It was a strike before for sure. So it's not new, but it's the single best thing the Hawks do as far as a team is concerned. Um, year in, year out, is take care of the ball. That's very helpful. Um, I, I think the defense, this is an important caveat, the defense with Capella could be in the bright spot category because as bad as it's been in recent days, and it's been bad without him for sure. The Hawks right now, as I record this podcast, are number 14 in defensive rating. Now that's not great, but that's above average. And the Hawks were in the bottom five for like most of last season. Um, So it doesn't feel that way right now. I promise you, I've I've watched every game twice or three times sometimes. Uh, It doesn't feel that that way, but the defense has actually been okay for the full season. Um, The number with Clint on the floor would be number seven in the league. And the number, by the way, with Clint and John Collins on the floor is 107.5 defensive rating. That would be number one in the league. So if you could just replicate all of the numbers when Trey, sorry, sorry, when John and Clint play together defensively, the Hawks would be elite on defense. It's just that they're not very good in any other, any other combination. <laughs> Keep that in mind. So obviously things crater without Clint. Uh, that's always been the case in this in his uh, in his tenure with the Hawks. But defensively, has still they've still been better overall than they were last year, and he is the biggest part of that. Um, also in that vein, as a smaller positive takeaway, the Hawks have been creating more turnovers this year. Last year, they were bottom five, like number 27 in the league in turnover rate. Defensively, this year, they're in the top 12. So that's one to circle as well. Nothing crazy, obviously, for a team at 17 and 19. But uh, if you uh, ask the question, I will answer it. There you go. I will wrap up now by answering a couple of combined questions into one. They basically are asking like how likely it is for the Hawks to make the playoffs at this point. How would I assess the rest of the, reg- of the regular season if the Hawks don't make any major moves? Um, what's what's the projected standings, etc. I got a lot of questions. Thank you for asking the questions, by the way. And there, uh, you always can um, find me for questions at BT Rowan on Twitter or at Lots on Hawks on Twitter or Lots on Hawks at gmail.com if you have a longer question. But before I get into some win total projections and stuff like that for the East and all that, the big thing is the injury. So, for example, again, the Hawks are totally different without Clint Capella. Uh, so if he keeps missing a bunch more games, it's going to impact the Hawks' bottom line. 
Um, overall, I think it's actually um, not as bad injury wise as people might have thought that it's been so far. The Hawks have been pretty similar in terms of injury absences with key guys as for a lot of people and a lot of teams around the league. It's just magnified because of how bad the Hawks bench is and because of the recent injuries and the recent play without Capella. I think that McMillan's been coaching a little bit harder and playing fewer guys because he's trying to navigate these waters and get some wins. But the Hawks only have like eight guys they trust. And if you're missing two or three of those, that's really tough to kind of overcome. But they've only had a handful of guys. Like Bogey's the only guy on the roster that's missed more than nine games this year, which isn't crazy, but like it's not like they've been totally beat up either. Um, anyway, as far as the East is concerned, the Hawks are not in as bad a shape as you might think. Only five teams, I think, are like safely projected ahead of the Hawks. It's the Celtics, the Bucks, the Sixers, the Nets, and the Cavs in some order. Something could happen with those teams, obviously, with an injury to like KD for the Nets or Embiid or Giannis. But otherwise, those teams are all better than the Hawks, and they have a head start on the Hawks in the standings. So it would take some weirdness for the Hawks to pass any of them. Uh, but the thing is, the Hawks are only two and a half games back of the sixth seed right now, as I record this on Sunday. And the sixth seed also right now is the Pacers. And the Pacers are not very good, in my mind. They're okay. They're better. They're, they're a nice story. I think the Hawks are better than the Pacers still. Um, as long as they are at somewhat full strength. So that's a team that I would circle as being like kind of vulnerable after that. It's the Heat and the Knicks. And uh, not terribly scared of either one of them. The Knicks uh, are not a team that I think is uh, fantastic. They're okay. They're decent. They're plucky, et cetera. Miami, I think, is better than they've been so far this year. But I was also lower on Miami coming into the year. So I've not been terribly surprised. Obviously, they own the Hawks in the playoffs last year. But that's not the same thing as, as a regular season matchup. Um, Toronto is behind the Hawks. And so is Chicago. I think the Hawks are better than the Bulls. The Raptors, eh, that's they're kind of a weird team right now. They're kind of the Vibes are not the Vibes are not great. They're actually kind of the closest team to the Hawks in a lot of ways, and that they're underachieving and the vibes are bad and all that stuff. But anyway, it's not a hot take, clearly, but I still wouldn't be surprised if the Hawks were to succeed, even after all of this. Um, but they could be as low as like 10 or 11. So the gap is pretty wide, and the the uh, sort of projection band is pretty wide for the Hawks right now. I would pick them to make the play on to make the play in at least, unless crazy injuries continue, like with Capella or Trey or something like that. But as far as you know, I, I did frame a situation a second ago as like not being a bad, and I, I, I do believe that. But at the same time, there isn't a huge margin for error at this point. Um, like the numbers tell you, the Hawks have a negative net rating for the year. They're minus one point two. That's like a thirty nine win team. It's not terrible. Cleaning the glass is a little bit worse than that. The Hawks are actually on like a thirty seven win pace if you go by like the the adjusted numbers for like non garbage time and all of that. If that's predictive, the Hawks will probably be a play-in team, like a low-end play-in team, like a 9 or 10 seed. Um, I'm not, again, I'm not sure the Hawks have had like really bad injury luck this year. Bogey obviously got a very slow start, and everybody's kind of missed a handful of games, but nobody's been out for a long, long time. Every, again, every caveat applies. If they miss Trey, if they miss Clint, or if they have like cluster injuries, it could be brutal. But like, it hasn't been that bad injury-wise, which is maybe not a great sign, because again, the depth is a major concern, as it has been throughout the campaign. Uh, lastly, the projections, as I pulled them today on Sunday, 538 has the Hawks at 41 and 41 with a 49% chance to make the playoffs. And by the way, playoffs is top eight at the end, not playing. So top playoffs is the actual playoffs, the, the top eight teams where the Hawks lost to the Heat last year. ESPN's BPI metric has the Hawks at 39 and a half wins with about a 35% playoff chance. Uh, team rankings has the Hawks at 38 and 44 projection. Number fire, 39 wins. So no teams, like none of these systems are projecting the Hawks to like go on a crazy run right now. They are playing and they are earning, in my mind, a below 500 mark to this point. Now they are better than that on paper. I think the Hawks are better than this, than they played so far. That's a question I get all the time. Like, are the Hawks actually this bad? I don't believe they are, but they're also not playing as well as I thought they were, thought they were going to play coming into the season. I had the Hawks at like 49, 50 wins this year. That number is going to be hard for them to achieve at this stage because they have to go very, very crazy. But on the bright side, if you want to kind of be optimistic at the end of this podcast to start the new year, the Hawks have been really good in the second half of the season in the last two years. Famously, two years ago, they went on a crazy run in the second half of the season. Bogdan Mitch went crazy. They played defense for the first time in a while, and they played their way into a top five seed. Last year, they were much better in the second half than the, the first half. They were, playing, they were playing well by the end of the year, and when they were healthy, they were pretty good. This year, um, unfortunately, there's no like injury stuff to point to other than Bogey coming back. And even then, they've been kind of worse, not, not because of Bogey. They've been worse recently with Bogey in the lineup than they, than they were before he came back. But all that said, the Hawks are right now what they are. And I think it's Bill Parcells' quote, like, you're, you are what your record says you are. And right now, that's kind of true for the Hawks. I believe they're pretty good still. 
but the, the, the vibes are not great. And obviously we talked about the organizational chaos. None of that is helping for sure. This could be a tough road trip to bring it all full circle at the end of this podcast. The Hawks could easily go 0-4 on this road trip. That should not surprise anyone. I'm sure it would frustrate and maybe infuriate people. But when you're an underdog and probably all four games individually at tip-off, you could go on four. And also, you could go three and one on the road trip. And that wouldn't stun me either. So it's a pretty wide range of outcomes for this team. We'll see how they're playing after two days off and New Year's and all that stuff. But uh, it's a good time to uh, get right if you are the Hawks because the schedule, uh, not to go crazy into the future before the end of this podcast, the schedule is not great for you in January. When you get back, you play Milwaukee. You have to go to Toronto. You play Miami. You have to go to Dallas. You play the Knicks. You have to go to Portland at the end of the month. Like, it's not terribly difficult, but uh, the next, I don't know, five weeks, it's going to decide the season. That's a very large sample size, but the Hawks have a pretty difficult schedule for about five weeks. And if they can navigate that, the stretch run is much easier, and we'll get more into that in the near future. All right, that's it for me on this January 1st, New Year's Day edition of the podcast. Yes, I'm recording on a holiday. There you go. Uh, please subscribe to the podcast across podcast platforms, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, uh, Odyssey, Google Play, and we're also on YouTube. If you are trying to support the podcast the most ways possible, the best thing you can do is to subscribe across platforms like multiple times and also download multiple times. Tell your friends about the show, spread the word, uh, click around old episodes, um, subscribe, resubscribe, uh, all that stuff to like game system. I'm not above asking for that. It definitely helps the podcast. It helps me to have more downloads slash clicks slash views on YouTube. All of that definitely helps. So if you just want to help out the podcast in, in the new year, that's the best way to do it. Also, I'm writing about the Hawks again at patreon.com slash BT Roland. You don't have to be a patron to read that, although definitely that is encouraged if you want to uh, support that endeavor as well. Also, uh, please, please, please spread the word about the Lawtime Podcast Network in general. And uh, thank you for listening to the podcast, everybody. We'll see you after the game on Monday evening.